welcome everyone to the seventh episode of the Real Emergency Podcast. Thank you for joining us for this case review of intracranial emergencies. We will also have another episode in January on intracranial emergencies, so look out for that date uh, later this month. Real Emergency is produced in partnership with Hanteavy, Real DX, and 410 Medical, and it's powered by Prodigy EMS. I'm Hillary Gates, Director of Educational Strategy for Prodigy EMS. I want you to know that all episodes are available to you for CAPSI credit on Prodigy's website. Also, check us out on your favorite podcast platform where all of our audio-only episodes live, and make sure you follow us on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to see you there. Let me briefly introduce our three resident experts. David Spiro is a pediatric emergency physician and professor at the University of Arkansas Medical System, and he's the chief medical officer of Real DX. Peter Antevi is a pediatric emergency medicine physician, EMS physician, and the founder of Pediatric Emergency Standards Incorporated. And Mark Peel is a pediatric intensivist at WakeMed in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's a medical director with WakeMed Mobile Critical Care and founder and chief medical officer of 410 Medical Innovation. We are honored today to have three special guests who will also be lending their expertise. Chris Moore is the physician who brought us this case today. Dr. Moore is an associate professor at the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. He directs both the emergency ultrasound section and the fellowship program at Yale. We also have with us today, Shane Moskowitz. Dr. Moskowitz is a neurosurgeon who completed his residency and his endovascular surgical neuroradiological radiology fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio. He is currently the neuroscience medical director at Broward Health in South Florida, and he's also a tremendous EMS advocate. And we may get to see Dr. Brajesh Mehta today, um, but when he jumps on, I will introduce him at that point. So some tips for watching today, everyone. We want you to weigh in. The panelists will ask you for your feedback. Feel free to um, unmute yourself, use your mic, keep your camera on. You can also write questions in the chat and we can call on you to share. Uh, the case today, you'll be watching the clinicians in the hospital care for a patient with a left-sided severe headache. I know as a paramedic, I've always wondered exactly what happens after I drop off a patient and this video will uh, answer those questions. EMS clinicians bring vital assessment findings to the neurology team caring for our patients. Think back to the neuro neurological emergencies you've treated in the field. I'm sure you have lots of stories about the complicated airway, perfusion, and symptom management. So let's get started. David, Mark, and Peter, it's all yours. First of all, honored to have the guests, honored to um, present with uh, Mark and Peter again. It's uh, been an amazing journey for these seven vodcasts. I'm glad we, uh, we have another great showing today. Thank you for the learners. We want you all to participate and uh, chime in, ask some questions. Uh, we've made this a little bit different. Oftentimes with these, um, you, you can only chat, but you can certainly speak up. So we want you to speak up as our uh, participants, we will learn. And one of the reasons why Peter and Mark and, and I have done this is actually we, we're, we're, we're selfishly wanting to learn from these cases uh, and uh, we're bringing in some amazing guests. And today is one of the best guest panelists we've ever had. And um, getting back to this case, this is a case of sudden onset left-sided severe headache. It's a very severe case um, and um, before we even get into the case, I want everyone to know that all the cases at Real DX, all of the patients sign informed consent. So they waive their protected health information rights to be allow us to learn from these cases. So I just wanna honor all the patients and particularly this patient for her willingness to uh, allow us to create content for learning. Uh, I also uh, wanna, specifically call out Dr. Chris Moore, who actually created this case. He's a panelist today and he can certainly comment uh, uh, around this case. Dr. Moore is uh, an emergency physician and we also have some other specialists that may want to chime in. So with that, I'm going to present this case. Uh, this is a woman that presents with sudden onset left-sided severe headache. I, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention for all the EMS professionals on this call, um, even though this patient is in the hospital, just imagine that you're at the bedside in her house or apartment, um, and this is gonna be an incredible case. So uh, David, sorry for that, and go ahead, thank you. No, please, awesome. 
I'm Dr. Moore. Okay. Thank you for taking the time to do this video with us. Sure. We're gonna get you something for your headache, okay? That'd be great. Can you tell me just quickly again, what made you come into the hospital today? I got up to urinate this morning and while I was in the bathroom, my head just started excessive pain. Um, I actually laid on the bathroom floor. I was able to get up, try to lay down on the bed. I couldn't do the pain. So just sudden onset of a severe headache, is that accurate? I'm sorry? You just had the sudden onset of a severe yeah, headache? Yeah, out of nowhere. Have you ever had headaches like this before? Not like this, no. Okay, you've never had a stroke or, you know, no. bad headaches or anything? Okay. Do you so I'm going to just quickly stop here. Um, would love for Chris to sort of uh, chat a little bit that real quickly, the vital signs of the patient, the patient is 60, temp is 95.4 Fahrenheit, heart rate 59, respiratory rate 18, pulse ox 98%, blood pressure 129 over 89. Chris, coming on to this patient, I know uh, the video is created after you did, did the initial assessment, but what are your thoughts coming into this patient just in terms of general appearance? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be news to anyone that this patient doesn't look well. Um, and, you know, basically this is the sort of textbook definition of a thunderclap headache, a, a sudden onset worst headache of the life um, that she's had. Uh, so, you know, obviously we're going to go to neuroimaging in this case. So I, I, hopefully this is not, not too subtle in that way. I mean, sometimes people, look a little tired, but, but she really looks like she's uncomfortable and, and ill. And if she doesn't have a history of this before, it should definitely make you uh, worry about intracranial pathology. Peter, as an EMS director, when you look at this patient and then you actually want to try to uh, take what the patient looks like and you're teaching constantly in your role as an EMS director, vital signs, how do you, what, what, what are you thinking in terms of vital signs or if anyone else it, 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 that's attending, how, how you're interpreting the vital signs is related to this patient? Because I'm always thinking about how do the vital signs relate or not relate to, to the presenting uh, concern? Yeah, uh, David, I mean, they're very important uh, along with the clinical assessment. And here's why, especially in my neck of the woods, and <clears throat> maybe I'll get into this a little later, we have to figure out where to get these people, make sure we get them to the right place the first time. And if this, if this patient presents and she's a mile away from hospital A with this set of vital signs, and we bring her to that location that does not end up having the capability to treat her, we potentially just created a two to two and a half hour delay um, of getting her to the right place, which could be the difference between life and death. And so, you know, looking at the heart rate, looking obviously at the blood pressure, but really her mental status, doing a full uh, exam to determine what are we really dealing with here. And in, in the field of EMS, as many people on the call know, people try to tend away from this word of like being a diagnostician and we don't make diagnoses and so forth. But uh, I'm sorry to tell you that we, we do and we have to have a list of items that could be going on with her based on this heart rate of 59, based on a blood pressure, which actually right now looks pretty good. Um, but I think her mental status, first and foremost, would alert me to say, potentially she needs to go to a certain type of hospital. And maybe a little later on, David, I'll, I'll get into that. Okay. Uh, and yeah. Anyone else want to comment on the bottle signs? All right, um, and I, and we're assuming, by the way, she's not on a beta blocker. So uh, let's continue. Uh, David, David, I think, I think, I think Dr. Dr. Moskowitz, yeah, go ahead. Dr. Moskowitz, uh, please. Do you think, uh, the one thing that I find interesting for someone with a severe, severe headache for her heart rate only to be 59 and her blood pressure to be 129 is just an observationally interesting. Typically, these patients are more hypertensive. I mean, I know the diagnosis, so I'm cheating, but they're typically more hypertensive and they're typically uncomfortable, so they're a little bit more tachycardic. I don't know that I would do anything different, but just a mental note for someone who's that uncomfortable to not be demonstrating 
cardiovascular physiological signs of pain. It's just something to make a note of. I'm just curious about um, what you, you know, in the first five or 10 seconds of a case, we're supposed to assess the general appearance. What is there something visceral that's happening for some of you when you're just seeing her talk to you? Like what, what's coming up for you in the first five or 10 seconds of seeing this patient and the way she's engaging with you? We've seen a minute of this case. Yeah, as a paramedic, when, pe- when patients look this uncomfortable and they don't wanna um, engage or um, it's too painful for them to make eye contact, um, she's slow, she's um, very fatigued. Um, these are scary um, patients because they clearly want help, but they're in so much pain that it's interfering with their ability to give you a history. So that's really tricky. And, and, you know. Uh, the, the only comment I want to make here is that, you know, obviously we've all heard, you know, this whole thing was labeled, in, you know, intracranial hemorrhage and that type of thing, or intracranial emergencies, and we kind of been going down that trail. But if I would have told you that, let's let's remove the headache part of it, and let's say that she came from a bad part of the town, from a trailer park, and you know that type of thing, all of a sudden I could steer you in a completely different direction. And all of a sudden, people could be thinking, "Oh, maybe she's just on drugs, or she's uh, that." That's so. So I just want to remember, have everyone remember, she she's a good historian, thankfully. But if she wasn't, what other things would you have to look for? Right, her blood pressure is not elevated, as Dr. Moskowitz mentioned. Her heart rate's not elevated, and so what are some of the other things to look for in physical exam and history if we didn't have the thunderclap headache um, told to us? I'm also wondering if she's photophobic. I mean, just the way her, Chris, Dr. Moore, did did you think that she was photophobic the way she's interacting with you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you see a lot of these patients in the emergency department. When somebody acts like this, uh, I think somebody mentioned drugs. It's either psych drugs or something really bad. (laughs) Um, Sometimes people are, you know, strange the way they interact with you. um, But, you know, you can't write it off until you, have seen that. And I think she was avoiding the light in this case. I mean, we turn the light on for the, for the interview, but the, the light was bothering her. Chris, had she gotten any narcotics for pain at this point? That's a really good question. And to be perfectly honest, I can't recall. I know she was still having headache. We were planning on giving her, you know, some more um, medications. I think, you know, uh, a good choice here might be something like fentanyl, which is a, uh, which is short acting, um, but uh, I, I don't recall if she had had medications. It, it's very possible that she did. Okay, let's continue. And, and, Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that, you know, for, for those of, who are in EMS who are listening, if, if you had this patient and you, and you decided to travel 30 miles down the road past hospital A to go to hospital B, you better have some so, something, you know, kind of, uh, whether it be vital signs, physical exam, and be and be prepared to say, hey, this this is why I think something's going wrong with this lady. I think we already have um, the main thing that we need, but I see a lot of people here commenting on the physical exam. I'm looking, I see cranial nerves, pupils, getting a differential. So keep thinking in that mode. You know, as a as an EMS clinician, that's what the expectation is. Hillary, I'm not able to access chat. So, are there any are there, are there any comments from from some of our uh, attendees? Yeah, uh, incredible differential. So, um, Carrie Cross says, "I'm not sure we have all we need. I'm not not sure she's met our stroke activation protocol yet. She's definitely not an LVO. Everyone wants to know the blood glucose and the ETCO2. Um, and then we're getting some other really cool exam ideas like cranial nerve exams from Dr. Corey, um, point of care, iStat, um, those types of things. So, um, just really keep it coming. You guys really okay. great stuff there. Great. Let me, uh, continue playing on. Did you take any blood thinning medication or anything like that? No. You have other medical problems we should know about? Multiple sclerosis. Okay. Do you take medication for that? No. Okay. And, um, did you have nausea or vomit? Uh, Dr. Moore, does multiple sclerosis have, uh, I'm not an adult physician. Does that throw you in one way or the other or not, not so important? I mean, I think we'll get into the neuro exam a little bit. I mean, if they have, you know, existing deficits from, from MS, that's kind of a, a, a abbreviated way of asking about that is to see if they're on medications. So a lot of people do have 
relapsing, remitting MS, and some people can have it dormant for a long time. Um, so I think it, it's certainly relevant if she has active MS with deficits, but, um, but may not be completely relevant to, to this case. Okay. Vomiting when this all happened? I just spit up a few times. Yeah. Any weakness, numbness, blurred vision, or difficulty with your speech? I did earlier. What did you have earlier? Uh, problems with my speech. Problems with your speech? Okay, it's still a little bit. Slow. Can we talk a little bit about her speech? What we're seeing here? What What are we seeing, Dr. Moore? What What are you interpreting from just the way she's talking to you? Is there a word that you would use for this? Yeah, I mean, her speech is certainly slurred. So again, um, you know, in the absence of intoxicants, um, I'd be very worried that this is, you know, a, a neurologic process. Intoxicants such as alcohol or, um, for example. Yeah, no, in emergency medicine, you always got to be worried that somebody, you know, did some drugs and is acting weird. <laughs> um, and alcohol could certainly do it. Um, but, you know, you got to take this seriously if they, you know, especially if they tell you that's not what's going on. Chris, is she, is she holding her neck for, like, she keeps putting her hand towards her neck. Was she, was she complaining of neck pain or did, could you elicit any, um, any pain? Yeah, I think this is a, an abbreviated interview. I'm not sure how much we got into that. Um, you know, it is, I think, typical in this sort of case where you may have some pain going down the neck. I don't recall her being like, you know, meningeal or, or, or anything like that. Blurred, huh? But you've had some medication. Okay. Like I said, we're going to get you something for your headache. Um, got your blood pressure here. I'm very bad. What's that? I have very bad pain in my, I have degenerative disc disease on the left side of my neck. In your neck? But where is your headache? Where is it hurting? Oh, just straight across my forehead. Okay. And how bad on a scale of one, one to 10? It's over a 10. So would you say it's the worst headache you've ever had? Yes. And it came on very suddenly? Yes. Okay. So the other thing we're setting up for, we talked about is we're going to have to do a procedure to um, put you on a breathing machine so we can do the, uh, the other procedure to relieve the, the pressure on your head. Okay? okay. All right. Do you have any other questions about that right now? No. Okay. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. I hope you do okay. Thank you. Okay. So now that we've seen a little bit of this, obviously it's quite abbreviated. We have a sense of the vital signs. Let's get into what we're thinking. What are the first things, uh, Peter, I, I don't know how much you wanna go down the EMS track, but I'm just thinking like, what are the first things you wanna do uh, if this were at the scene? What are the first things that you'd like to accomplish? And, um, and what are you thinking about in terms of a differential diagnosis that'll help you make a decision about what things you want to be doing in the first, you know, those first golden minutes of, of managing this patient. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we have moved really in a, in a really downstream direction here in a very good way in South Florida and we're continuing to grow. Um, and again, I can fill these slides up in a little bit, but for me, she, she's breathing on her own. Her sats are fine. We don't have an end title, but I would presume her end title is fine. Um, and obviously, this person needs a hospital and needs a subspecialist at that hospital. The question is which hospital to go to. Um, and for years, we would just, at least in South Florida, just say, everyone go to a comprehensive center, right? If, if, if we're thinking anything that's intracranial um, in South Florida, we only go to comprehensives. We bypass all the primaries. However, think, things are changing uh, nationally. And certain centers can do different things. So again, I won't go into this right now, but I'll, I'll fill some slides up later as to we are now educating all of our EMS clinicians to be able to detect which patients may need uh, an intervention that may require um, a neurosurgeon, which therefore requires only a comprehensive stroke center. So this is a very, very important time in the pre-hospital environment to determine where to go um, and so for everyone watching, I think someone had mentioned it, that in their mind, they haven't really activated stroke, the stroke pathway. But when you think of bleeds in the brain and you think of the stroke scales, we use the race. The race will be elevated on these patients who have bleeds, number one. Um, and just because a patient doesn't have a you know, uh, a hemiplegia or 
you know, any lateralized deficit, that doesn't mean that they don't rule in for the stroke pathway. And that's the kind of the 2022 education that I'm going to be pushing for uh, this year with, with my entire systems. Hey, Peter, um, to David's question, um, I'd like to ask Dr. Megan Corey to unmute and um, ask this question because we're getting to the ABCs here, especially the history of uh, a paramedic who's run patients like this. Megan is asking a really great question about airway. Can you tell us that question, Megan? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm wondering, we're trying to anticipate all the time that, okay, this patient might go to imaging really quickly, but um, what do you do with her airway before imaging? I mean, right now she seems to be managing it okay, but you get nervous that she's going to lose her airway in imaging, which is like the worst thing you can imagine. And then also seizure prophylaxis or seizure you know, do you have lorazepam in your pocket when you go there? No. Or, you know, how do you, how do you th think ahead? And how can EMS providers think ahead? Well, Megan, we're going to actually see an airway procedure in just a few minutes, but uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Moore to talk about his thinking about whether to intubate before or after imaging and his thoughts around that. Yeah, I mean, certainly at this point, we, we sort of knew what was going on, but, you know, just Talking to her, I mean, yes, uh, it's always a possibility, but she's mentating. She's obviously protecting her airway. She's able to talk to us. I don't think it's a bad idea to have some Ativan in your pocket if you go over to CT. And I think it's probably a, a great idea to have a, a clinician or, or advanced provider, you know, with her as she's going to CT as, as you would with any, you know, potentially ill uh, patient that could, um, you know, uh, go in, into a worse direction. So I think those are great ideas, but it, Seeing this patient without the imaging first, I don't think I would jump to intubation, you know, prior to CT. And Dr. Moore, what were you thinking about in terms of her differential diagnosis? Um, well, it's been brought up in the chat, and I think <laughs> people know where we're headed. But you know, thunderclap headache, worst headache of your life. Uh, you got to be thinking about, you know, spon and especially spontaneous without trauma. Um, a spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage is certainly top of my list. Um, you know. Other things, you know, complex migraines and stuff that are further down the list and less serious uh, are certainly certainly on there. Um, occasionally, we'll see tumors and, you know, intraparenchymal bleeds present like this. Um, but without trauma and sudden onset of headache, you know, those are the, the top things that I think of. And um, David do, and Peter, can we talk a little more about EMS management just in the field? Like what, yeah. what other pearls, um, Peter, if you want to start? Yeah. So the first thing I'll mention is that if, if this lady was found on the ground, right, because she just ended up there, we, we would automatically assume here that this is a, a, a trauma of some sort. And now we're thinking of, do we go to the trauma center or not as well? So that definitely factors in. Obviously, we're going to do the blood sugar um, and to, to address the airway part of it. Um, in, in a few of my agencies, we, we do DSI. So you better believe that if she was not maintaining her own airway for sats were low, if her end title was elevated, um, we, we would, we would DSI her. So we would, you know, we kind of moved away from RSI and we would, but I, I would say that we'd have to pay attention to her blood pressure. Obviously what you don't want to do here is drop her pressure, uh, to the point where it would, it would lead to a bad outcome. So just like in TBI, um, I would advise uh, my folks that if she did not to be, need to be intubated uh, and it could wait for the trip a few miles down to the comprehensive center, stroke center, or the trauma center, then that's what we would advise. And we use a respiratory rate of 10, um, making sure she can control her, her own airway. But if you're out there in EMS and you don't have the ability to do DSI, um, then you really have to be very adept at uh, basic you know, the BLS maneuvers for your airway uh, management and just making sure that you're addressing uh, if she starts to throw up uh, that, and that type of thing. And I think uh, Janice and Louise nailed it. Um, head up position, right? 30 degrees, a little bit elevated. Yeah, I see Shay wants to jump in on that one. Good. I don't want to interfere, but I'm going to make a comment because I think it's kind of important. I mean, I lecture elect, EMS on a regular basis and have done so for two decades. So um, I'll, I'll tell you the comment that I make about the airway and, and innovation issue that I think is worth discussing, not because I disagree at all, as much as I think it's valuable to hear it being said so that the thought comes to your mind. It is not so much that it, ABCs always have to come first. I mean, as much as I'd like to say neuro is the be all and end all, the body carries the brain. Okay. That's all it's the only job is. I know. But that said, in, uh, innovating a patient, if you don't have an airway, nothing else matters. A is the first letter. So airway first, period. 
all the other stuff has to come secondarily. So if intubation is required, go ahead and do it, right? The dead patient is, the use is not, not salvageable. And so it's so critical that even though we talk about what's going on neuro-wise, ABCs have always come first. So when you say that, you say, oh, I will then intubate the patient if you're even, even vaguely concerned about it. Totally fair. Here's the caveat. Doing so typically comes with a paralytic as well as a sedative, which means that the second you intubate your patient, you have no neurologic exam other than a pupil reaction. Fine. So you are sacrificing your neurologic exam on behalf of an airway. I'm all right with that too. It's taken me many years to become okay with that. Here's the catch. neuro exam before you intubated the patient, because that's the only exam that I have. So getting an exam that says, I don't know, she looked kind of sleepy and I don't like the way she looked. So I tubed it. Yeah. It's, so it isn't going to cut it. So yeah. I would think about what you're getting and what you're giving and what I'm going to ask you on the back end, go ahead and do it. Think A, but realize you've essentially stripped me of the only tool that I have, which is a neuro exam. And Dr. Antevi, Dr. Moskowitz, like this is a, a thing that happens to EMS in the field. Raise your hand in the chat if, if someone sort of guided you toward, um, please don't intubate that patient so because then I can't do a neuro exam. Or please don't give pain meds to somebody who's got belly pain because then it masks the truth. You know, so these are some things I like, Shay, that you said you've sort of come, come around. Um, but the, the important point here is to do that neuro exam before you intubate. So you have some data. Love it. Hey, Shay or Chris, can you comment on the CT scan? I mean, uh, paramedics don't normally read CT scans, but I think this is such a cool case because you're seeing the patient presenting and now you're seeing some of the imaging. So can you just quickly comment? Obviously, this is one slice, but can you comment about what you're seeing here? Basically, you can see, you know, the hyper, um, the, the the bright area uh, tracking into all the fissures in the brain. This is very characteristic of a diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it looks like Shay's off the phone. So, Yeah, no, but keep going. You're completely right. It's <laughs> classic, classic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, you can see all the beautiful sulci of the brain are really well-defined because they're all, uh, they've got uh, blood. It's almost like icing on top of the cake. You can Which see is the white area. The white the area. Blood. So to understand for the non-physicians who are looking at it, a CAT scan is basically your head. In this case, slice like an orange. Each slab is just a small slab. This is oriented in the following way. I can't use my mouse, but the back or bottom of your screen is the back of the head. The top of the screen is the front of the head. So it's as if the patient is laying on a table and staring at the ceiling and you're at the feet looking up. Right and left is, is symmetric, although right is contrary to what you would imply. So where the mouse is right now is the right side. So with that in mind, what you're looking at is the brain. Bone is very, very white. Water is... Dark air is black and fat is almost black. So what you see here are the normal fluid spaces within the brain. Those are ventricles. They belong there. Those are the darker bu um, bubbles, although we'll talk about what they, they, they're actually not normal, but they belong there. So you have a very classic subarachnoid hemorrhage pattern. There's air in the head, which I'm assuming means this scan was taken before an intracranial procedure was, after an intracranial procedure was done, because otherwise you shouldn't have air inside the head like that, which would make you think trauma. Outside that one detail, uh, there's also hydrocephalus, which is uh, abnormal. Uh, the fluid space is going to back up with fluid. And so they, the lakes, these high ventricles dilate. And so that's, that's kind of what we're looking at, a very classic pattern aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage with hydrocephalus. And there's more of the same. That's a coronal view. So it's a view straight as if you're staring at the face. It's the same exact appearance. The ventricles are dilated. The blood is in the subarachnoid space. Very classic pattern for aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Thank you so much. I want to get into the, um, we're going to get into this, uh, uh, into the drainage procedure. I think some of the paramedics will be really uh, interested in this, but I want to get into the um, the airway. So let me play this case. So I have twenty of atominate and a hundred of sexy. Right? Atominate's going in. How are you feeling, ma'am? Atominate's in. Oh, okay. 
So 20 to accommodate, followed by. Um, we flushed it. And then Chris, can you just quickly talk about uh, the drugs you used and why? Yeah, there's a long history of literature regarding not trying to increase the intracranial pressure when you're doing an intubation procedure. We used to use lidocaine pretreatment for everybody we intubated. Um, that really hasn't shown to be that helpful. Um, in this case, the fentanyl is probably the, you know, the main thing to sort of blunt that response, which we gave. Um, you know, as long as they're not hyperkalemic and, you know, don't have problems with spinal issues, uh, succinylcholine is a good um, paralytic. Uh, and then we, atomidate is a very, you know, good short acting agent that will um, allow them to be uh, induced for intubation, you know, typically 0.3 megs per kilo. Uh, so we gave 20 milligrams of that, 100 of sucks um, to, um, you know, basically make her sleepy and, and relax her airway and allow us to intubate. So that's the, the basics. Real quickly, in pediatrics, we use a lot of rock over sucks. You want to share a little bit about why sucks over rock? Rock your own. Yeah, I mean, rock is not not a bad choice. Certainly, if you're worried about um, you know hyperkalemia, that rock is a little bit uh, longer onset and a little bit longer acting. Um, so you know, sucks is often used if there's not a contraindication, since it, it comes on so fast and also will will wear off fairly quickly. If for some reason you can't get the airway, the patient may resume their normal breathing at that point. Chris, I wanted to comment also on that you mentioned you want to avoid the hypertensive response to intubation, which was long thought to be because of laryngeal manipulation, right? A, a sudden spike because of the noxious stimulus of that. And so what about ketamine? And I'm curious about Shay's uh, opinion here. There's been a long history of uh, neurosurgeons, trauma surgeons feeling like we shouldn't be using ketamine for that reason. However, the data now are that it is uh, super acceptable and, and maybe even superior in some cases of traumatic brain injury for intubation because it improves cerebral perfusion. And you're right to mention the hypertension we want to avoid, but we also want to avoid at all costs hypotension. And I think you probably won't get that with Atomidate. You could with propofol. And was that in your thinking at all? I guess you knew the diagnosis here, but if you assume she possibly has a subdural or a tumor or something else causing increased ICP, does that modify your uh, choice of drugs and how do you feel about ketamine, particularly in trauma? I, I certainly use ketamine. I think it's a great drug in a lot of cases, uh, probably more in pediatrics. Um, you know, the other thing is just also kind of using what you're used to. If, if there's not great evidence that one is going to be that much better, um, you know, in this case, the, the patient wasn't super hypertensive. Um, you know, our, our nurses and our, our resident physicians are very familiar with atomidate and succinylcholine. So, you know, in the absence of something that's going to really make a difference, I often will go with what we're used to. It, it yeah. tends to, to go a lot more smoothly, but I'm happy to hear from, especially Dr. Moskowitz, if he has opinions in this case on what might've, you know, if there was a better choice for agents. I, I want to say something that Chris just said that's really important. Being comfortable with what you're used to. I think that there are nuances here, but I think there's something to say about agencies and individual physicians and EMS providers being comfortable with dosing, especially when, you, when you're when you thinking about children and, and dosing around kids, but even with adults, getting comfortable with what you're used to. Dr. Moskowitz, do you want to uh, uh, opine? I, I agree with you completely. There's, uh, I mean, for something that you do uh, as often as you do it, I mean, I would say thousands of times a day, but I would hope not that often, but you know, for something you do so frequently and so often, there's uh, something to be said for consistency and protocol. You don't forget things, you don't make mistakes, you don't choose dose errors. Everybody knows what you're doing, it's so much more important. The reality is, is that most of the agents that you're talking about uh, are all perfectly fine for the neuro patient. Remember, you're losing their exam with rock uranium anyway, and you're gonna end up monitoring and treating your ICP anyway. So I don't think it really makes much a difference here um, in, in this particular situation. Personally, I think the more we stand on ceremony, the less likely it is to actually matter. And so clinically, if you're used to using uh, ketamine, then that's what you should use. I mean, whatever you normally do is what you should do, because I don't think the drug of choice for sedative actually really impacts clinical outcome from a neuro perspective uh, in this process. And just to, David, just to chime in to Mark's point that um, we have Tennessee, Iowa, Virginia, St. Louis, 
um, North Carolina, Kansas, many of our listeners are using Versed in their intubation. So, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, ketamine, using ketamine in their intubation. So, um, you know, look at how the EMS field has uh, embraced some of these um, changes. Awesome. And, and, and uh, uh, David, just one more comment from here is that I think one of the biggest mistakes that we see is that people get a sedative, they get paralyzed, and then because the patient's not moving, they end up not getting any further sedatives. So that's the one issue with rock that, I mean, we're, we're, we're big, uh, ketamine rock is kind of our, our platform for DSI, but we'll give ketamine rock, we'll do the procedure, and then we'll end up giving another dose of ketamine because what happens is the ketamine wears off way before the rock does. And you'll often see patients with tears coming down their face, their blood pressure spiking, their heart rate spiking, and then people want to just give another paralytic uh, once they start bucking the tube, which is the wrong thing to do. So I think that if you're going to have a DSI or RSI program, you really have to understand that the paralytic should be used once and then the sedative should continue so that you, get, you, you give that person a nice, uh, easy landing as they go forward into the hospital and beyond. And Peter, what dose of ketamine quickly do you use for that? Two per kilo. Great. And, and Peter, um, what about like non-convulsive seizures? What if these patients um, are having Perfect. these that we can't see subclinical? What about the EEG um, status epilepticus? Yeah, so it's a great question. For refractory status, so they get 10 milligrams of intramuscular Versed and they're still in status, we will, we will use ketamine at one milligram per kilogram IV or three per kilo IM. We have, uh, we have our data on that and yeah, to the tune of, uh, over 93%, we have, we have stopped all refractory seizures, which is incredible. It's the first time that's been looked at in EMS. So ketamine, in my opinion, is a right drug for all the reasons. And then you'll have a lot of people who will, we can talk for hours at a bar about sucks versus Rocky Ronium. Hunter is going in. We'll get it up. Just leave it on right, man. We just have to leave the oxygen on for now. Hunter is oxygen. It's relaxed. Good boy. The crew's pre-oxygenating with a non-rebreather standard for you all. Yeah, there's also some controversy around this. I mean, some people like to know when the, you know, people stop breathing and their oxygen sat drops. My, my personal philosophy is give them as much oxygen as you can before you paralyze them. It gives you more time. Um, so that's, that's the way I do it. Right. And note they have a cannula under the non rebreather as well, which I think is smart. Yeah. Positioning the patient with slight neck extension. Yeah, and the cannula is also monitoring the end title, which I actually I like a lot more than using the oxygen saturation to monitor what's going on. Um, David, can you stop for just a second? Who one wants me to stop the video? I want to keep playing the video. Well, I know because I want to speak to the, okay. this last comment. That. Remember that um, everyone should know that the that the ETCO2 that's being monitored with the nasal uh, cannula there the way that the oxygen goes into the nares, um, when she's apneic, she's not gonna um, be getting any of that oxygen. So it's really important that if you are doing pre-oxygenation with a nasal cannula, you use a nasal cannula, not a uh, capnography nasal cannula. We, we've learned that the hard way where I worked. Right, and, and the, the other comment is that we've actually stolen from Jeff Jarvis, the tower of power. We'll, we'll use a BVM with a, a PEEP valve and so forth. So go ahead. And just quickly, uh, Dr. Moore is obviously creating the content that that's one of the learners. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah, that's one of our senior residents doing the innovation. And what, what device are you using here? Uh, it's a GlideScope. Um, it's pretty widely used. Um, the nice thing about it from an attending perspective, it used to like have to just, you know, sweat and hope the resident's going to put the tube in the right place. But now we can really watch it while they, uh, while they do the procedure. Really nice view where you pause right there. There's some secretions, but you can see a nice wide opening right through the cords there. Got a real nice view of the cords right there. Starting the tube with the stylet. I'm gonna watch it. There's some secretions in there, but all right. Nicely placed right at the vocal cords. Sometimes we just gotta work it around a little bit to get it in there. 
Like it's Real quickly, that uh, because on keys I'm always thinking sizes. I know it's standard, but you're using I'm assuming a seven or seven five cuffed. Is that correct? Yeah, typically seven and a half, even an eight uh, uh, cuffed ET tube. Um, yes. Oxygen is good. Silet is coming out. You can see the tube well placed through the vocal cords. We're inflating the 10 cc syringe. How are you confirming the airway placement? Uh, what is the confirmation procedure at your institution? <clears throat> uh, certainly great to see it go through the cords like that. And then you're going to listen bilaterally and then you're going to check, you know, end title as well as oxygen and then ultimately, you know, a chest radiograph. Peter, what's the standard right now in the EMS community for intubation when you're working with young or early paramedics? Are you using um, video uh, or not? What is what's happening? Yes, now? yeah, we we've, we've converted uh, uh, completely to video, but 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 I will say that what what I had to kind of modify and I use a Jeff I use Jeff Jarvis's model is that. We in EMS will typically be doing this at 60 miles an hour on the way to the hospital. And we, we've stopped that because you could see how, you know, uh, it, took, it took them a couple of seconds to kind of get everything in there and to get the, the, the tube through the cords. Um, if, you're, if you're doing this in a rush in, in the pre-hospital arena, just to get somewhere faster, you're, you're probably not doing it right. So we actually have slowed down this entire procedure so that we do it either on scene or in the back of the ambulance, but, um, and, and everything is now videoed and recorded so that we can have CQI afterwards. And there are several products out there that can do that. Tracheal tube, yep. he's on the vent. We're checking bilateral breath sounds. Positive and tidal. Good and tidal on the ventilator. Equal bilateral breath sounds, nothing over the epigastrium. Okay. 23 at the gum. Great. We're going to do uh, some sedation. 7.5. If someone's recording all of this, it, it, you know, for pediatrics, it's incredibly important to know where you're at at the gum line. Usually it's 3x the size of the tube. Uh, early learners typically push it in and do a right main stem uh, because of their own epinephrine levels. But um, so where, where do you want to be gum line? Where are you thinking? Uh, I mean, 21 to 23, depending on the size of the patient. Um, I, I do want to just point out, I think maybe it was Peter that mentioned the sedation thing. That is the one thing I'll see with residents over and over. They get into this procedure, they do it, and then they wait until the you know suck starts to wear off and the patient's getting agitated, moving around. They're like, oh, we need some sedation. They ask the nurse, it takes five or 10 minutes to get the drip ready. So as soon as you, even before, sometimes you've innovated, like, let's get something ready for sedation so that we're ready. And I think that's that's super important. Don't wait for that. 7.5 ET tube, and we're going to do some sedation after. Yes, I'm going to recycle the blood pressure. If it's still adequate, we'll do propofol. Do you want an OG tube? Okay, we'll do OG tube, and then we're prepping for the EVD procedure. Okay, thank you all. Nice job. Mm -hmm. Peter, do you want to quickly, this is awesome. Peter, do you want to quickly show some of your slides, and then I want to quickly get into the neurosurgical procedure just for the last few minutes. First, what I want to show is the race data. So hopefully some of you or all of you are using some type of pre-hospital stroke screen. And you can see where I have pointed here is that obviously we're looking for, uh, with, with these scores, people think of an LVO, right? An ischemic stroke. However, in this particular case, look at the number of hemorrhagic strokes that the race score has picked up in this particular case. So just because someone doesn't have a left-sided or right-sided deficit doesn't mean that they don't fall into this. And clearly someone who's got an altered mental status, um, the worst headache of their life, they have to be considered. So, but what I wanted to go over real quick was these are national stroke center classifications that have changed. So acute stroke ready hospital, the primary stroke center, we know that's, the, that's where you can get a CT scan and get TPA, but here's the new one here, the thrombectomy capable stroke center. So I told you all in Broward County, from 2015, we just said, you know what, only go to a CSC. But then we now have a Florida stroke registry and we now have national certification. And in with that has come this new thing called the TSC, thrombectomy capable stroke center. So with this patient, 
if this patient only goes to a place that can do thrombectomy, then she will not get the treatment that she deserves at a comprehensive center. And this is why I was making the comments I made earlier. These are the two things that can be, that can accredit a DMV or joint commission. But I wanna just point out here that the difference between a CSC and a TSC is that if they're nationally certified, they have to do a certain number of subarachnoid hemorrhages per year, a certain number of coilings and clippings. And that's why you need a guy like Shea Moskowitz um, in these facilities, 24 seven, 365. And this lady should not go to a TSC who doesn't do these types of procedures because now she's just gonna buy herself another ambulance ride to another, another facility. Um, and again, you could see here, this is national stuff here. The TSC, it's all says possibly. So sometimes they do take care of this, but not 24 seven, 365, whereas the CSC does deal with this. So I'd like to just ask Shay just to kind of jump in as someone who you know, is the leader of a, of a CSC and a TSC. What are your thoughts for the EMS professionals on this call as to uh, you know, choosing the destination for this patient? <laughs> it's a sensitive political subject, so we'll begin with that. And since we're covering a lot of the United States here, that makes for an interesting conversation regarding uh, both the politics as well as destination guidelines. It's a sensitive subject, as you can imagine, because hospitals all want business, um, period. <laughs> Fundamentally, I mean, here's the thing. What would you do? The grandma rule has to apply. Where would you want to take your own grandmother? No more, no less, it's just that simple. If you have a place down the street that can do everything without question, why would you make a pit stop anywhere else along the way? Now that may or may not be true if you've got a long way to go and what you might need is emergent stabilization, in which case there's a length of time in which you say, well, look, it makes no sense if you're, you know, you're about three hours by fixed wing and the closest city is Billings, Montana, which, which, by the way, for the state of Montana, that actually is what it is. If you need a three-hour fix when to get there, um, you don't want to wait the three hours. On the other hand, if you have it in your backyard, a higher level of care, well, I'm not sure why it would make sense. Now, when you put it in that perspective, that's what the AHA's guidelines now are, which is uh, destination guidelines are that you should go to the highest level of care uh, within 30-minute drive, period. If it's going to take more than 30 minutes to get to the, no, the nearest comprehensive stroke center, then make a pit stop along the way to then stabilize the patient at the highest level available to you. Now, South Florida is an interesting animal because it's uh, geographically very dense, but small, which means that there really is no reason why you couldn't get in your car with almost no exceptions and get to a comprehensive stroke center within 30 minutes. That is a unique geographic environment. That said, outside this area, that becomes a little bit more challenging. And in some way, where that bridge makes some sense for more rural care is integrating TSCs or primary stroke centers with comprehensive stroke centers so that the work's not being duplicated. They are getting to the closest hospital, becoming stabilized. Yes, you're right, you need to go to the next point, but at least... The receiving point is completely integrated with the sending place, which makes a lot of sense. And that way you're not losing stability, uh, the patient's stability along the way. Uh, but personally, uh, that grandma rule has got to apply. You take your grandma to the best place the first time, period. Uh, Chris, Dr. Moore, can you please set this up? I'm going to also have Dr. Moskowitz's uh, uh, comment, but can you set up? You know, we you intubated the patient in the ED to get, to set this up. I'm assuming, but can you uh, explain a little bit about how this this came to be? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, this this case, as you can gather, it, we kind of knew what was going on. We when we uh, decided to go ahead and film it, um, but they essentially um, neurosurgery had been consulted and uh, elected to put in an extra ventricular drain, um, which. Um, it's something actually I, I haven't seen very often done in the ED setting. I mean, often done in the neuro ICU, I suppose, or even the operating room. Um, and occasionally down here, I, I think we had capacity issues in some of the ICUs. Um, so it was an opportunity to actually see this procedure. I think I'd maybe seen one other one in medical school, but it's not something I see, you know, day to day in the emergency department, but, um, you know, uh, 
I think Dr. Moskowitz could probably comment better on the actual procedure. Hi, I'm one of the neurosurgery residents. We're doing this EVD for this patient that has subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, I cleaned the site. I measured out uh, one of our landmarks called Coker's Point that we do our EVDs at. Uh, it's basically mid pupillary line, about 10 centimeters back. Um, I have a drill. I am about to drill. I infiltrated the, the field with uh, lidocaine. Okay, we don't want to slow you down. Go for okay. it. Just a warning that I think this goes on for quite a while, just so you, <laughs> everybody knows. Uh, I, I'll, I'll fast forward, it, but I just wanted to get it started. And Sorry, I'll just walk you through most of it. So basically, the, the comment is, is that the hydrocephalus fluid is backed up. You simply need to decompress the fluid. you got to give it somewhere else to go. So very much like if you, because there's a lot of uh, uh, medics and a lot of ER folks, so you'll understand pneumothorax. Everybody knows what that is. But basically, you have too much air in the chest, and the lungs can't expand. The brain has kind of the same problem. There's too much fluid. It's got no way out. And because of that, you impact the ability of blood to get in the head, ICP problems. You just simply need to decompress. So if you think about a needle decompression it's or chest tube, the world is kind of similar in some way. So in that capacity, what you're trying to do is put a catheter into the fluid space. The problem is that unlike the chest, we have spaces and soft tissue ahead. Here's my, this is my, my friend here. That's the orientation in your image. So you have to get through the skull to do that. And so the line is in the mid pupillary line and it's right behind or at the coronal suture. So it's kind of right at the convexity uh, off, off midline. And what you do is, is this little tiny hand drill. You drill a tiny pencil hole size uh, through the bone, uh, which is kind of what's going on there. Uh, it should be smoother, but that's okay. Um, you feel the different layers as you're drilling through. You'll have to take my word for it. It's a feel thing. Um, uh, once you get through, the dura that's underneath it, you can puncture with a blade or a, or a stylet or something to tear that through. Uh, the incision is actually a little bit bigger than I so so somebody commented, it's not tiny. The incision there is a little bit bigger than you, you know you might, but the hole itself is about the size of a, a pencil hole. That's the size of the, the hole that you're drilling. And then what happens then is through that hole, the catheter gets passed perpendicular. Uh, to the, the surface and that, you're now poking at the dura. So you tear a hole in the dura, otherwise you can, do, you, you can do that. That's, by the way, the only thing that actually hurts is the opening the dura. Otherwise, the brain doesn't feel any pain. Not very gentle, but, but be that as it may. The catheter then passes perpendicular to the skull. No, the brain actually doesn't feel any pain, ironically enough. No, that's why you can do awake surgeries. Um, um, so there's the catheter being passed perpendicular through the hole, like ice fishing, if you'd imagine. Uh, you don't actually see where the catheter goes. It's, I don't think there was anybody from up in Michigan, but, but you know, ice fishing is what it is. Um, you don't see where the fish are. You just simply know that if you drill a hole, you can drop a line and it'll take you where the fish are. That's what this is. So using craniometrics, which basically means you kind of know where your trajectory is based on the skull. So your entry point is in the middle, the middle behind the eye, uh, right at the coronal suture and you're passing it in. You're angling toward, patients usually in this position for me, you're angling toward the junction between the canthus of the eye and the, the, and the, and the hole of the ear. Now my hands are big enough that I can actually physically do this on, on, on a head and actually feel around it. So you can use uh, craniometrics to know what your trajectory needs to be. Everybody's head is, for the most part, built the same way. So by using that, you can thread the catheter into the ventricle at a fixed depth. You can confirm that you have release of CSF, which is what she was doing uh, shortly ago. You connect that to a tunneler, and you just tunnel that out backwards. Once that's in, uh, and you can see it's being tunneled and, and being laid under the skin, you're done, more or less. You've got to kind of clean it all up so that incision flows connect the catheter to a collection system. And now you think about it, you've got a top off valve, if you were, which allows the CSF a way out of the head, out of that ventricle, which is dilated in a way that you can collect it sterilely and monitor output. Well, Dr. Muscovitz, thank you. Uh, and, you know, I, we'll, we'll sort of wrap this up here. I'll turn it back over to Hillary, but I wanted to thank 
Dr. Zmor and Moskowitz for uh, attending and being our guest panelists today. You guys are awesome. I want to thank Dr. Moore for his amazing uh, video skills. And, uh, and I want to get back to the patient, thanking this particular patient for letting us learn from her. Uh, this was a tremendous hour. I know that the um, last piece was a little bit beyond some of our skills, but I thought we thought it would be important for paramedics to see where this goes once you drop the patient off. And we don't often see that. And uh, we thought it would was gripping and, and learning a little bit about the anatomy. Okay. And then, and then Dave, David, what about, uh, I would love to hear what Shay real quick has to say about the aneurysm itself. I mean, how do we stop the bleeding? Okay, so uh, super fast, a couple things. You asked, someone commented before about seizure meds. So typically, once you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you confirm that that's actually what's going on. They often get loaded with seizure meds. And the reason is the risk of having a seizure is extremely high. The brain is extremely irritable. A seizure we know comes with spikes in blood pressure, and that would be potentially catastrophic. So subarachnoid hemorrhage patients are always prophylaxed with seizure medications. But I don't know that I would do that right out of the gate until I knew that that was the diagnosis. So that was comment number one about, about Keppro or seizure medication for that regard. Um, Chris mentioned something about location. Um, that's hospital specific. Your docs might do them in the ICU, might do them in the ER. I've done them, uh, or the OR. I've done them in the ER. I've done them in the hallway. I, it, to me, it's completely irrelevant. Geography is geography. I'll do them in the hallway if I have to. I've done them no, I can't say do it while moving. It's really tough to do, but I have. Um, and ideally, you want to do it in a, as controlled an environment as you can without delay. Um, so I'll do them in the ER. I, I have no problem with that. They find it really fascinating. Um, the last item, Peter, you were talking about is the aneurysm itself. So to understand that, that what follows from here is once you have your ABCs are done and the patient is stabilized, you still have the underlying phenomena, which is the ruptured aneurysm in this case. You need to confirm the, the, the approach at this point is diagnose the problem, fix the problem. The diagnosis usually at this point comes with non-invasive imaging, like a CT angiogram, uh, plus or minus catheter angiogram. So you want to know what the vascular anatomy is and what bled. And then based on that, you define how you fix what bled. And the reason is not because it's actively bleeding anymore. And the reason is simple. Active bleeding in the head is very quickly fatal. So if that patient had continued to bleed, they never would have made it to the hospital. They would have died in the ambulance or at home. So whatever bled, tamponaded itself temporarily, and that's the key. So you've got a very short window of time before whatever bled bleeds again. So figure out what it is and then treat it. Now, if it's a, an aneurysm, which is what this case was, the treatment of choice is to secure the aneurysm. An aneurysm is a bubble on the wall of a vessel. The goal is to exclude the bubble from circulation. You can either do that surgically by physically clipping the outside of the bubble, meaning a craniotomy and sneaking in and clipping it, or going with a catheter through the leg, winding up on the inside and filling it like you'd fill a pothole, filling it with metal or some other device that obscures flow from the aneurysm. Either way, the aneurysm doesn't fill. If it doesn't fill, it can't break. So that, that's kind of the very very quick and dirty approach to uh, aneurysm. So if it turns out it's not an aneurysm, meaning it's an, an AVM that ruptured or a tumor that ruptured, then you have obviously a completely different decision tree as to how you go about managing it. But number one, stabilize the patient. Number two, figure out what the problem is. Number three, fix the problem. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Moskowitz. Dr. Moore, everyone's asking on uh, patient outcome. I know you have some short-term data, but we could also follow up with longer term. How'd she do? Uh, well, I needed to do that. Actually, I, I, like I said, um, you know, she certainly survived in the short term. The, the issue is long term neurologic outcome. Uh, you know, they can get vasospasm uh, is, is, a, is a significant issue in this, and that can cause problems down the road. Um, I could it would take me about five or 10 minutes to look and see if there's data in the chart now that, you know, to see how uh, she's doing. But I can give it I'm to you. Sure. Easy. Data broken down is very simple. A third of patients with a ruptured brain aneurysm never make it to the hospital. They're found dead at home. Of those that survived the initial rupture and make it to the hospital, you divide it in three. One third don't survive their hospital stay because of things like spasm, infection, all sorts of things that complicate their care. One third of patients survive their hospital stay but are severely neurologically injured 
and then one third recover back to what we refer to as good outcome, which has its own definition. It does not necessarily mean normal, but it's satisfactory outcome. So you got a third. The best predictors are the worse you are going in, the more likely it is you won't survive. The older you are going in, the less likely you're going to do okay. That's pretty much about it. I mean, those are the numbers. The catch is, is that it's a statistic and statistics are the great liar, which means that you don't focus on an individual and say your chances of having a poor outcome are poor. It, everyone's an individual, not a statistic, which means you try to give everybody the best shot they can. But we are well aware and you need to prepare the family that it, it may not work the way you want, even in the best of circumstances. So I don't know where this patient um, fell in, but given the way she looked, uh, assuming her course was OK, I would predict a pretty reasonable chance of having a good outcome just based on how she looked going in. I want to thank uh, our special guests, uh, Shay Moskowitz and Chris Moore, uh, for joining us today. Incredible knowledge. And I hope you know that everyone in the chat said the same thing that all paramedics feel, which is we never get to hear about our patients. We never see what happens to them when they get to the hospital, and we should. Um, it would improve our clinical um, acumen uh, a lot. Um, and so seeing these procedures is really incredible. Thank you for being here. Thank you, David, Mark, and Peter once again. Uh, David, for the great case. Um, this uh, case will live on Prodigy. It will live on YouTube. Uh, for all of you awesome educators, uh, use this in your classroom. Use it as a lesson plan. Um, use it to uh, generate a discussion after learning about uh, you know, neurologic emergencies. We'd love to hear from you and make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We'll sign off for the day. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.